So I'm in the university, right? And I'm a product of the university. So it would be, you know, I'm like in the university today kind of thing. Um, I did share earlier how I got introduced to prison studies or the industrial, prison industrial complex. Maybe briefly share it here. I was an activist. I was in grad school and I barely showed up for my classes. I don't recommend that to anybody. Um, but I was on the streets a lot in New York City and a lot was going on between the police, part time, you know, there's a ton of stuff, violence against women, rape, culture, AIDS, you know, everything was going on, so why go to school? And um, I met Davis through political organizing, not through the academy. So that completely changes my perspective. Like I don't, like, I don't do celebrity culture, I don't ask for autographs. I've been with Davis where I have to like tell people to line up where they get their autographs and stuff like that. But it never dawned on me having seen people beaten up in the streets or like fight the police on the Brooklyn Bridge and then have teenagers with like um, number nine irons. And I know they're not golfers, so I just assume they got them from the cops on Staten Island behind us. Like so the police are a threat in front of you and these black teens who are being paid by the police to threaten you from behind. It just, it's incongruous. It's just, when you go to the academy, it's another world, it's another universe. It, like, it doesn't translate because there's never that level of physical threat. I mean, violence does happen on the academy, but it's considered to be privatized, you know, sexual assault at different times of aggression, and you go to the cops for it, or you go through your counselors or something. So having met Davis outside of the academy made me look at the emergence of abolitionism inside the academy with a lot of skepticism. Because I'm like, what is it doing here, <laughs> you know? And Davis asked me to do the prototype of crit resist at CU Boulder. And I spoke a little bit about how much that cost. It was more money than they'd ever spent. They called me in to justify that expenditure. I was working for free with white radical students who the FBI wanted to talk to because of the Earth Liberation Front and they thought their friends were in it, with black working class students who were first generation and just hated being in Boulder because it was just the anti-black animus just radiated from everywhere. But they formed a coalition to do this conference, the largest ever, Davis was the keynote, all these people flew in and that was the prototype. But in the process of seeing what the Academy did to, with that, it was very off-putting. It was, you know, the money, they asked me to come in and justify the money. I told them, keep the money, I'm going to bed, I'm not coming in. And they spent, they gave the money anyway because they wanted that, we do prison stuff, we do, we have Davis, we have a former political prisoner, we have a celeb. You know, it was, it doesn't mean they didn't care about the people, it just meant the way in which they were gonna make connectors to anonymous poor people who were incarcerated was gonna be through this kind of intellectual production and consumption that needed a star, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And once that unfolded, the radical politics for me began to disappear. So I did the first anthology, was not here, was States of Confinement from Boulder, organized with Paul Grave to send 50 into the prisons. The Panther wrote back and said, thank you very much, this book has nothing to do with our lives. And that started about five years to a decade of anthologizing political prisoners at Brown, with Brown students, with undergrads who were brilliant, who probably didn't do their classwork the way they should have been doing it because for them this is a political endeavor. So I trust whatever surprises the academy. I don't trust anything that's on the menu of the academy. And that doesn't mean I won't work with that, but it's the disruptor yeah. that I find that brings in new energy, new thoughts. It's once it's on the menu, you know, you just select what is already preset for you. And there's nothing about the academy that has revolutionary desire. Yeah. And if abolitionism is about revolutionary desire, then you're caught in a contradiction. Like you do the best work you can, but you understand because it's capital, that capital likes markets and capital trades in markets. Mm -hmm. And this becomes another item to trade, then you're very protective. I think the way that you guys are envisioning it and doing it here and there's other places, 
People are innovating to protect so that the authenticity and the purpose remains intact, and it's not a photo op. But again, my origins are not the academy. So I always kind of stand back and want more, even if I'm not going to get it. I'm just not guessing what you said, so I just eating it up real quick. All right. Um, I'm going to blend two questions. Okay. Um, you used the phrase hyper intellectual to describe George Jackson. Um, what do you mean by that phrase? And um, in George Jackson's own writings, um, he uses the world, word third world. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of my peoples inside, you know, used to, well, we third world, you know, this is, you know they made it a, a thing, to, to, like a badge of honor, you know, because it represented struggle. But um, we want, I wanted to know, we wanted to know, you know, on a larger scale, what is third world nation in a first world country? Besides how, a colony, how do, how do you describe? How do you how do you describe? Define that. Yeah, that's why I wanted to start with Kathleen, even though she wasn't in the title. And increasingly, I just keep coming back to Kathleen. I mean, the way I read Kathleen, it's a colony, right? And so, is it going to look like a colony in which the elites drift towards structure and just reinforce structure? You know the elites of a colonized caste or race, right? Or can it look like something where we organically organize to redefine structure? And I think it's more, it's, I think in a competitive culture, the point is to be exceptional. Like the first black this, or the first brown that, or the first trans this, or the first woman this, et cetera, et cetera. And that exceptionality is supposed to be protection, right? But the people I meet who are the first don't seem to be particularly happy um, in the spaces they occupy. They feel to be pressed on all sides. And as, as much compassion as I have for them, I try not to, I try not to forget about class because then I can't think about poor people. Like my mind has so much bandwidth. Like if my students, you know, and they really have real needs and desires and they're really struggling and they feel persecuted and they are persecuted because it's just, it's just the nature of, you know, institutions, right, that are built historically. Well, you know, you do the whole slavery and social justice, so you know what it's built on. That is real suffering. But so, you know, are people living in NYCHA, public housing with like lead paint and mold and rats and dealing with the NYPD or homeless people or trans, you know, people. There's a caravan of 60 trans folks that came across the border. And, you know, Trump just said he doesn't do asylum. And, and one of my former, Tony's former students from Brown is now um, an attorney and works with big oil and gas, but pro bono does all this work. Well, they've been, you know, tortured, they're mutilated. You can clearly see that they need assistance, but they ban medical help, they keep changing the rules when the attorneys can come meet. And it's, that for me is a level of reality that has to coexist with people who have more material privilege and who are suffering too. Mm -hmm. But because our spaces tend to be isolated, the suffering among the privileged tends to dominate these other stories or these other stories become like trauma discourse or trauma porn and you just get overwhelmed by it and you turn off the news or you stop reading you know, the news feed. So I went with Kathleen because I think Kathleen does what Angela does not do. I think when I listen to the discourse of Angela and abolitionism, there's like a promissory note, right? that if we do restorative justice, if we keep staying with the program, we're gonna have some kind of evolutionary uh, moment and move to a better place. And if you look online, she's like, um, she has a forum with Michelle Alexander at Union Theological Seminary. 
because Michelle Alexander Wright is an attorney, taught in law school, and she finally said, you can't reform this after she did the new Jim Crow. So she left law school, and now she's in a seminary. And so she asked Angela, is this an article of faith? Is this religious faith that stuff is going to get better, that abolitionism is going to work? And there's this pause, because there's no answer to it. So like struggle now is aspiration. It's now desire. It's, in, it's now important things like community care, but that does not directly confront predatory structure. And that's the missing piece. And that's why you know, I have to go back to, to Kathleen, who even talks about class divisions among black people. Okay, so much of the narrative I found today is like we have to stick together and then we have to have coalitions with everybody. And I'm like, what's the ideology? And then it's like intersectionality. And I'm like, no, that's additive. There's an intersectionality, like you could gender, race, class, sexuality. I've never heard anybody add ideology into intersectionality. Because I want to know, like, if you're feminist, da, 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 are you a liberal? Or you're radical. Because if I don't know your ideological marker, we're not going to work together just because we have precarity. Mm -hmm. Because the material conditions are not going to be changed just by precarity. They're going to be changed by people who actually have blueprints. And that's what we're missing. I feel like the blueprints, they didn't, they didn't work, you know? Well, they don't work, you know, if the FBI comes in like Fred Hampton and kills you, <laughs> like at four in the morning. Or they don't work if Chris Hani gets assassinated in South Africa because it's a communist and alternative to Nelson Mandela. Or they don't work if Martin Luther King, you know, yes, they don't work because you have these pauses. But the violence against us is not going to stop. I mean, this time they just burned the archives. And then they burn the churches. And then they do it. The violence will never stop unless we have a blueprint. And it feels to me that the academy wants to study the phenomenon, but will not offer a blueprint and will not green light anybody who takes the risk to try to draw up a blueprint. And that's where I see Davis's promissory discourse or Alexander's retreat into seminary being the primary black feminist architects as not delivering. Like, I'm grateful I teach the work, et cetera, et cetera. But, like, does it, I mean, I'm sorry, it's not funny, but like, I don't, I have to stop. <laughs> I mean, like, who, who, I mean, come on. I don't, I mean, I, talk, I say talk this way to my 10 year old. Mom's got it, don't worry about it, everything's gonna be okay. And then I stay up all night because I can't figure out how everything's gonna be okay. You lie to children for a reason. You don't lie to adults. No, that's right. Mm -hmm. Unless what? Unless you're the kind of person that does. Unless you give narratives that are promissory. Um, the last kind of provocation, and I'll open it up because I don't want to uh, predominate, but in your reading, in reading you, you talk about the framework of the expanding carceral state and the shrinking free world. And I just, you, when you discussed how there's, there's got to be a situation of the kind of explicit violences that meet with residents of NYCHA and the folks who are deprived basic, you know, human necessities at the border, that needs to be situated and contextualized next to the, the material, the suffering of folks with more material privileges as well. I guess I'm interested in thinking about this framework of the expanding carceral state and the shrinking free world as enabling us to think outside of the prison as the paradigmatic and exceptional site of suffering period? Like, does that invite, does that invite us to think analytically about the suffering that constitutes the larger world? Or, you know, is there something missing? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I think I want to go back to the anthologies we were doing at Brown and why political prisoners were so important. I think the political captives have 
answers to the questions you're posing to me. But nobody seems to read them closely or sufficiently. You read them like in somebody else's book that's talking about them. You, like, you read them through filters, right? I think the answers that are being posed to academics should be the answers that are posed to revolutionaries or the questions. Do you see what I'm saying? See, my argument as, a, as an academic for somebody who's been in this game and who's going to play it a little longer and then retire is that the structure itself blocks a certain type of clarity. So we were at the Foucault Circle, the conference at Stonehill over the weekend, and I had to, you know, so I do my, you know, my talk, whatever, and it's about how Foucault took his conceptual ideas from George Jackson and Angela Davis. And so Heiner writes about that in City Lights. And then I push it a little further, right? Because I say that the first critique of Foucault, 96, and it's not perfect, but the one that appears in Resisting State Violence, I got that from black activist women at Megar Evers College, right? And then after I did that in Angela's grad course where we studied Foucault, Angela wrote a critique where she talked about elimination, that Foucault couldn't deal with the convict prison lease system along with racial erasure, like our absence mm -hmm is not just our absence, it's also the absence of death in some way. Like if you write black people and Muslims and brown people out of history, you sanitize how violent history is. It's not just that we disappear, it's like you, you miss not just the slave, but the slave catcher, mm -hmm. right? And if the slave catcher disappears, then you don't understand function. Right? And then the whole divide between the free world and not so free world. I mean, for me, it's, I'm interested in function, if that makes sense, right? And so Davis and then Heiner and others, but one of the threads I was thinking of is all of the writing that we're doing, even Foucault when he wrote The Mass Assassination of George Jackson, and the first English translation was in Warfare in the American Homeland. All of that was sparked by activism, including activism on campus, like students who should have been studying for their exams or like trying to organize you know, a conference at Brown on political prisoners, or they were editing the content that was going in the anthology and their names are by the bios and things like that. that, that you're performing your role in the structure, but you carve out time for yourself to create another role that's tied to activism. And that's where insight comes from, because insight <clears throat> comes from action. It does not come from text. Obviously, we read the text because that's part of our training. That's our skill set. But I'm making the argument that the ideas that are grounded, that are novel, are experientially made as art and survival mode, mm -hmm. right? And that, is, that connector is what we've lost. So you get the ideas of George through Foucault. And it's OK to teach Foucault in the classroom, but it's not OK to teach George Jackson which makes no sense whatsoever, since if you want a genealogy, you go back to George to get Foucault. Discipline and punish, that comes from Jackson. And you could say from Davis too, but for me, Jackson was Davis's captive maternal. He was a nurturer and he was also scary, because I'm uncomfortable with that level of violence. But I don't want to act like an ostrich and pretend like it doesn't exist in the world. And I don't want to tell people who are marked for assassination what they should and should not do. But it's not even here. Like, what is our discourse in Yemen? What is our discourse about the Rohingya and the Buddhist in, you know, militias in Myanmar? What is our discourse about Somalia? Like, our discourse from an empire that is really good at violence, its citizenry is really not so skilled in articulating an analysis of it. So even if we have our projects, if the depth of our analysis is like skiing on top and not deep sea diving, then what we produce in the world is superficial. And that sounds harsh. Yeah, but so is dying in prison. <laughs>